Good afternoon. I'm Judy Woodward, the History Coordinator of the Ramsey County Library, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to part four of this series with J.B. Anderson on the history of psychology. Today's topic is Freud, his critics, his case studies, his psychosexual theory. J.B. Anderson is an educator, curator, historian, and writer. He is the creator of the popular Presidents series. Today's program is brought to you with the co-sponsorship of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota and the financial support of the Friends of the Ramsey County Library. We are deeply grateful to both these organizations. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to turn things over to our speaker, J.B. Anderson on the topic, Sigmund Freud, his case studies, his critics, and his life and times. Thank you. This is week three of Sigmund Freud, week four of this quarter. I did uh, Milgram ahead of uh, Freud. And uh, uh, next week, uh, no class. Uh, the week after, I will do Alfred Adler. Uh, there was a question last week about uh, flying dreams. Uh, it was submitted to me via email, not uh, here in the uh, program. Uh, about a third of all people have had flying dreams or report having had flying dreams. Uh, men ha have uh, more of them, like maybe 40% versus 20% of women. But for the population as a whole, it's about... Uh, one third of all people have had dreams of flying. Now, uh, you know, these dream interpretations are subjective, meaning they vary from individual to individual, but uh, nonetheless, we'll do kind of a broad spectrum uh, interpretation here. Uh, generally, it's believed these are releases from daily pressures or they are feelings of. Um, uh, freedom, you're floating, you're flying. Uh, there was also a question about id, instincts, and snakes submitted via email to me. And it asked, can I clarify about id uh, being compared to impulses or instincts? And do humans have instincts? Or is it all innate learning? Id is the theory of uh, Freud's. As a theory, it's not a real thing. It's kind of like the mind. You know, we think of the brain when we say mind, but it's really something different. I'm pretty much a nurture-oriented person. Uh, almost everything we do is learned. Not much of human behavior is an instinct. Uh, also a question about uh, uh, snakes and the fear of snakes and our fears learned. Uh, yes, they are. Uh, do animals have unconscious minds? Uh, is there proof of this in animals? Well, uh, we don't know, or I don't know. Uh, but as to fears, uh, there was a study done in the late 1920s called the Jones Study on the Fear of Snakes. And he had people bring in their one-year-old kids, and he'd have the kids sitting alone and present a snake near it. And uh, that was fine. Uh, he'd have three-year-olds do the same thing. Snake would be presented. Generally, that was fine. Then he had the mother present for the one-year-olds and the three-year-olds, and he'd present a snake, and the reaction of the mother, who had now learned fear of snakes, uh, was her reaction affected the child. Uh, and by the age of, of uh, three, children were very much aware of what was going on with their mothers. So uh, at any rate, Jones proved that uh, fear of snakes is learned. Uh, as are all fears, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, further, veterinary research uh, shows that animals are responding to their owners mostly for a single reason, food. 
Uh, however, owners say uh, this animal that we have is part of our family. Uh, it's no different than a son or daughter. Uh, there's great humanity in our dog or our, I had a pet bird or in our pet bird. Um, uh, so I don't know, do we trust the research by veterinarians who say this is all uh, food oriented or uh, do we trust our own um, attachments to these animals? Uh, my pet bird would, uh, we had it closed off from downstairs. It could only be upstairs, but I'd come in the front uh, door and it'd be at the top of the stairs whistling at me. And, uh, and food certainly wasn't an issue. With dogs, you put food out and bang, it's gone. With a bird, we had food all around uh, upstairs here and water. Uh, so it could pick at it as it wanted. It didn't eat everything all at once. And, uh, but it would come over and land near me and put its head down, meaning it wanted its head scratched, et cetera. Uh, on to Freud, we'll finish him up today. <clears throat> uh, one of the major concepts in Freudian psychology that we'll talk about uh, first is psychosexual development. And here's an introduction. Uh, psychological development occurs in childhood. Today, everybody goes, well, so, yeah, sure. That's, oh, we got that figured out. However, back in Freud's day in the late uh, 1800s, uh, there was uh, an assumption that um, uh, this was not the case. Uh, Freud places a great deal of emphasis on these first five years of early childhood and the kind of formation that occurs and uh, further says that almost all psychological develop, uh, problems develop during uh, these first few years. So this is another big change that Freud brought about. Uh, you know, there was this uh, notion that we're aware of everything we do. Freud said, no, we're not. We're like an iceberg, seven-eighths under or seven-eighths hidden. Uh, there's an unconscious mind, and we push lots of stuff into that unconscious mind. We are not aware of who we are and why we're doing things and so on. <clears throat> uh, stages in psychosexual development. We're going to talk about five of them. First is uh, what Freud described as the oral phase, and that goes up through age one. Then the anal stage, which is from ages one to three. The phallic stage, which is, uh, deals with sexual organs three to six years old. Uh, latency period, and that's from six years until we reach puberty, latency meaning we're not sexual creatures yet. And then the genital phase, which is from the onset of puberty throughout the remainder of life, well into adulthood. Uh, some people move very smoothly through these stages. Other people get stuck at certain stages or have a lot of difficulty moving between stages. Uh, fixation is a term that's used for people that get stuck at a certain age, becomes a cloudy situation. Uh, there's a couple of reasons why movements stop. Um, the needs for a stage, such as the oral stage needs, where we uh, know about suckling or the anal stage where we're learning to be without diapers. Uh, you have to, we have to move from one stage to another. Sometimes those goals are never met. So we get stuck there. There's a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety as a result about moving from stage to stage. <clears throat> Second reason is you can get overly gratified at a single stage of development. You don't want to leave it. This is great. Uh, so I'm staying right here. 
Let's take a look at the five stages again. Oop. Let's take a look at oral. Um, this is centered around the mouth, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, the mouth is a sort of, so the, it's the source for food from a, a young child. Uh, you're either breastfed or bottle fed. So uh, everything's about uh, uh, the mouth, getting food in through the mouth, uh, being having your hunger gratified. Uh, in adulthood, if uh, you don't get out of this stage, common features that a person will exhibit are nail biting and uh, Freudians say also smoking. Freud smoked cigars, so he was accused of <clears throat> not having moved beyond uh, the oral phase. And uh, what did he say about this? He said, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. The anal stage. Uh, this is one to three years old, and it's about controlling your bowels. You're going to get rid of diapers here. Somebody else isn't going to be caring for uh, your expulsion or uh, uh, the cleanup afterwards. Uh, you're going to start gaining some self-control. You're going to be uh, you're going to be knowing when it's time to go to the bathroom and that there's a certain place you go to and certain things that you do. Uh, potty training here is critical. At first, you just leave the potty out, let the kid observe it. Uh, they walk, what the heck is this thing? Uh, they're still wearing diapers. I remember I'd go visit my sister who had a a uh, son that was uh, not yet one year or uh, two to three, five years old in that stage. And uh, I'd go to the bathroom, I'd open the door and there's a kid standing there in diapers looking at the door. Then he looks inside, looks around, you know, wondering what the heck are people doing in here? <clears throat> Your relationship with authority is developed you're getting some instruction now, and you can understand it. Uh, a parent's telling you what to do, where to do it, and uh, that whenever the need arises. Uh, if it becomes very controlling, uh, Freudians say the person has become anal retentive. Uh, Anal retentive people end up in adulthood not liking messes in the houses. Look at this desk, super clean. Or they're overly tidy at home. Here's a couple of desks. Uh, the one on the left is kind of is untidy. And the one on the right is uh, very well organized, straightened up, squared off, uh, et cetera. Uh, possessions are generally held pretty close by anal retentive people. They don't like to share anything that they've got. And that can be money, like uh, I'll, I'll pay for my own thing here at the restaurant and you're not gonna pay for yours. And uh, Objects aren't shared. Uh, now, there's another type of person that can develop during this phase called anal expulsive. This is a person who's very sharing. Uh, they haven't been controlled during potty training. Uh, they may have a messier lifestyle, such as we see in the graphic here. They're more disorganized than the anal retentive person. And um, they get more rebellious toward others too, people telling them what to do and so on. Our third stage is the phallic stage. This is uh, described by Freud as uh, where there's lots of pleasure seeking. Here's a young boy with his sister and he likes to sit close, uh, be close, feel like people care. Uh, but frequently there aren't concerns about the feelings of others. Uh, you're pretty much internalized. Uh, I, need, I need this stuff from other people. 
You're searching for love, searching for attachments. Uh, it's during this period of time uh, that we learn to deal with uh, several emotions. Jealousy is one of them. Uh, why does my brother get to do this stuff? Why does my sister get to do that? Why are they taking him? Why don't I get to go with them? Uh, feelings of rejection, rivalry. Uh, gee, I think they like him better or like her better. Um, the latency stage. Uh, this is called a hidden stage. Uh, sexual impulses are hidden, haven't reached puberty yet. It's between six years old and puberty. Uh, there are certain things that, uh, that we do during this period of time. <clears throat> we tend to be very uh, gender-based. Boys play with other boys, girls with other girls, very much oriented toward same-sex relationships. Uh, friendships occur. We really build bonds during this period. And uh, there's lots of hobbies. Play is real important. Interaction with others. And frequently that's done through gaming or sharing hobby notions and ideas. So lots of games get played. Um, you start school, you're going to school, you've got a regular schedule, you have to get up in the morning, head off to someplace else, and then there's school work to do, and sometimes that extends beyond uh, being in school. Uh, at the front and center of this period, six years to puberty, is um, an acquisition of skills, acquisition of knowledge. You're learning about what it is to be an adult uh, through these social interactions and being uh, basically a kind of forced into groups. And that's what school does. Then the genital stage. This is where sexual discovery uh, begins. There's, there is uh, sexual experimentation and eventually the, the uh, development of a single uh, relationship, unless you're in a culture that believes in uh, more than one wife or more than one husband. There are religious groups in the United States that do that. Uh, conflicts can develop uh, uh, during uh, this sexual awakening period. Uh, and these uh, difficulties can lead to what many people call sexual perversions. Uh, laws are frequently passed against them. Uh, usually the perversions may be the result of being stuck at an earlier stage of development. An example of reversion is really liking kissing, involved primarily with kissing, no sexual completion or uh, is, uh, accomplished. Uh, you might be at the oral phase, uh, stuck at the oral phase, so you love the, the kissing aspect. Next, we'll talk about the conscious and the subconscious, another Freudian concept. Um, are we aware of what we do? Through much of history, and especially in the 1800s, uh, in the later 1800s, when uh, Freud was born and becoming aware. Um, we knew everything about ourselves, and the assumption was we knew everything about ourselves. Uh, Freud's notions about having a, uh, an unconscious or subconscious mind <clears throat> led to quite a different change uh, society-wide about how people um, are aware of what they do, how much of it. Uh, the unconscious mind changed that and it changed the criminal system. Uh, you planned out what you were gonna do or that you were gonna murder this person. You thought about it ahead of time. You snuck up on them and then you shot them. That's first degree murder. You were aware of what you were doing. 
second degree murder, you got angry and then there was a gun there and you picked it up and shot somebody. Uh, it was a spur of the moment thing. <clears throat> Wasn't planned in advance, that second degree murder, lesser penalty. Um, and then there's third degree murder. Um, it was an accident. You hadn't planned ahead. You had did not have any intent to kill. It wasn't a weapon necessarily. Uh, it, uh, it was an accident, but it's still a murder. So uh, we, uh, we have a lesser penalty for that. Third degree murder is called manslaughter. Uh, so it changed that this notion of the unconscious mind uh, also made changes society-wide, such as our criminal and court system. Uh, how do we cure people, according to Freud? Well, we make them aware of uh, what's going on in their lives. And we use a lot of different techniques that we've talked about during the first two sessions, like free association and dream analysis, et cetera. Talk about Freud's uh, death. He died from cancer. It was a result of smoking. Uh, for the last 16 years of his life, he had these uh, red and white patches inside his mouth. Here you can see a drawing of a mouth it's got little dark spots, red dark spots and white dark spots. And uh, this is can be common among people who have been uh, smokers. Uh, Freud, uh, during, later in life then, when he was near death, uh, you know, the last few months had a lot of difficulty swallowing. This was again, the result of a lifelong smoking of cigars. What's Freud's legacy? Copernicus made us a speck in the universe. You know, the, the church, uh, the, the Christian church said we're at the center of the universe. The sun revolves around us. We are super special. Copernicus took a look at the universe and said, boy, we're, we're just a speck in the universe. Uh, we're, we're out uh, on the far edge of our own galaxy, and we're just one of several galaxies, etc. Darwin, we're descended from slime. You know, that flies in the face of being special creatures created by God. Um, Freud showed us to be violent possessive, unreasoning. Um, and that, uh, that added to the scheme of things here also. Uh, these uh, these uh, negatives that came about from astronomy, biology, and psychology uh, caused religion to move from uh, you know, you're a speck of sand on the seashore. What does God know of you, uh, even though you're in a special place? And they moved on to, you're very special in the eyes of God. Uh, and uh, democracy was uh, something that kind of flew in the face of religion once democracies started developing in the modern world. Uh, religion was uh, closely associated with the nobility, the divine right of kings, you know, you've been appointed by God to be the ruler of people, etc. All of a sudden, democracies come along and you have the uh, image and impression that people can rule themselves. Uh, positive interpretation of this on the next three pages. Uh, Copernicus showed us the truth of the universe. It's heliocentric. The sun is at the center. It's much bigger than it looks. It's bigger than the earth. Darwin showed us the inner relationship of all living things. Uh, uh, Freud showed us how to live with our shortcomings and then how to overcome them. 
And that's kind of, was kind of the point of those um, uh, defense mechanisms that we talked about. Um, there are ways we defend ourselves uh, from other people or circumstances in our lives. And it's uh, okay to use them, but you be aware. Uh, now we're going to take a look at uh, some case studies. Uh, there's a total of six of them. Uh, Ida Bauer, Herbert Graff, uh, Ernst Lanzer, Daniel Schrieber, uh, Sergei Pankayev, and uh, Bertha Pappenheim. Um, Freud dealt with uh, all of these people, uh, but uh, uh, one of them not directly, and we'll talk about that also. Uh, Freud published all of these case studies, and he would hide the actual name of the person. So Ida Bauer, when Freud wrote about her, called her Dora. Ida Bauer lived from uh, 1882 to 1945, died at the age of 63. This is a childhood picture of Ida Bauer. Uh, her parents were close friends with another uh, couple who would come and visit regularly. And Ida went to her parents and accused this male friend of theirs of making sexual advances toward her. And uh, she stated that uh, she slapped his face, today known as the Will Smith syndrome. Uh, she, uh, she wanted her parents to cut off their relationship with this man because he'd made these sexual advances and it uh, uh, ended up result of being, uh, you know, she had to get violent with the guy. Uh, the parents went to their friend, talked about it, uh, the guy denied it. He said, no, that's, that's crazy. I'd never do any such thing. And Ida's father did not believe what his daughter was saying. He didn't believe his friend capable of that. Uh, Ida started becoming reclusive, wanting to be alone, staying in her room, uh, keeping to herself. Uh, and then she started talking about uh, self-harm, including suicide. So this became uh, of great concern to her parents. Um, Ida's father took her to see Freud. They lived in Vienna. Freud lived down the street from them. She was 16 years old at the time. Uh, this is 1898 now. Ida explained that her father, she, ex she told this to Freud, my father's having a sexual relationship with this couple that come over to our house all the time. And the husband is the guy that made advances toward me. My father's trying to pawn me off on this guy to make up for the fact that he's got this secret affair going with that guy's wife. Uh, here's a book uh, about this case. This isn't the book written by Freud. Uh, Freud's Dora, a biography of Ida Bauer Adler, Adler, her married name. Um, Ida had a regular cough when she was seeing Freud. Uh, he, uh, he took a look at her and found there wasn't any inflammation. Her lungs sounded great. Nasal passages uh, appeared to be okay. Um, also, in addition to this cough that uh, seemed to have no uh, physical reason for it, she'd be unable to speak sometimes, loss of voice. Uh, Freud told her uh, during one of the sessions, he said, I believe you. I believe the story you're telling about this man. And uh, the cough disappeared. She had an advocate. There were two dreams that Ida had that she related to Freud and that he then published. One dream was our house was on fire. My dad woke me up. He comes into my room. He's screaming. 
get dressed. And she said, I got up, I got dressed very quickly. My mother's running from room to room. Uh, father says, what are you doing? I'm looking for my jewelry box. Forget about the jewelry box, the father says. We got to get out of the house. They get outside. They see the house is burning. And Ida wakes up. Second dream. She's in a town. It's not a town where she lives. It's a strange town. She's walking around. Finally, she sees her house. Oh, hmm. Well, isn't this strange? So she goes into the house. There's a letter on her on the bed in her room. And her mother states in the letter that her father has died. And, and her mother says, you need to go to the train station, get on the train and come to this uh, other town. So uh, she walks around town looking for the train station, can't find it. Finally, she finds it, gets on board the train, gets to the other town, and her mother's at the cemetery where they've buried her father. Uh, Freud interprets these dreams uh, sexually. Uh, and this is part of the famous phrase from Freud, the Oedipus complex based on an old Roman uh, myth uh, that Ida, and it's, it's a, a, a young woman desiring her father. Uh, her virginity is at stake now in, uh, and the, the jewelry box or a jewelry box was a symbol of this. Uh, at stake was this lost jewelry box. And the death of her father uh, saved her, according to Freud. Now in the late 18th, okay, today a jewelry box is a place where you keep jewelry. Uh, in Freud's day, it was seen as representing female genitals. At least that's how Freud interpreted it. And uh, this couple that Ida's parents were friends with, the guy who she's contended made advances toward her and who she slapped, he'd given her a jewelry box as a present. Uh, and it represents female genitals, according to Freud, during this period of time. Uh, the endless walking around in the dreams, not finding what you need to find, uh, Freud said she's searching for her sexual adulthood. She's right on the verge of becoming sexually aware or she's become sexually aware. Now she needs to, what happens when I become sexually active? Uh, so she's, what she's really searching for isn't a house in a strange town, a train station she can't find. It's uh, her sexual adulthood, her sexual identity. Uh, Freud also saw uh, uh, dreams as representing just simple fears. She reported uh, dream, uh, dreams that, uh, about uh, playing with her cousins and they would play with matches and they do this in reality also. And she became fearful of fires. So she had that uh, house burning down dream. Uh, in addition to the dream therapy, there were uh, other things that uh, Freud had uh, done. Uh, he said, I think some hydrotherapy, which is soaking in a bathtub, that that would be good for you. This is kind of a forced relaxation situation. You lay in warm water for an extended period of time. And it's a, it's a situation where you can't get out of the tub. You need, you need help on your own. Uh, he also suggested electroshock therapy for her, which uh, was used uh, well into the 1900s. And uh, it was uh, it relaxed patients, uh, made them uh, made them easier subjects because they were more likely to.
talk about things that were of concern to them. Uh, and uh, both the, the hydrotherapy and the electroshock therapy were attempts to calm the patient down, get them to a point where they could more rationally discuss what was going on in their lives. Uh, in 1899, uh, Freud published this book, Interpretation of Dreams. This is a photograph of my copy of it. Uh, and it's uh, still in publication. I suppose I should say it, it, I don't know why it looks so worn. Uh, Ida suffered according to Pro Freud from what he called petite hysteria, small hysteria. And uh, this is a small, it's fear or anxiety. And it was due to sexual advances that were being made to her uh, by young men of her own age. Uh, and they may not be direct, you know, it's just uh, body language stuff. Uh, and it's about the fear of her coming adulthood. Uh, I had to quit the therapy after 11 weeks. Freud wasn't ready to be done with her. Uh, Freud in the uh, a book he wrote about uh, Ida Bauer and this case uh, said that uh, for himself, this was a personal failure. Uh, Freud criticized um, when he published this uh, case, uh, critics said he's involved in mental sex. This is really about Freud, it's not about this girl. And it's inappropriate for a medical doctor to uh, have these kinds of thoughts, be publishing these kinds of uh, interpretations. Years, uh, years later, uh, more up into the 1900s, uh, Freud's notions became more acceptable. Uh, and uh, people started talking about the case. They said, hey, her cough was cured simply by Freud accepting what she had said, whether he meant it or not. Uh, the, the, the problem was really her parents and their world, not her. Freud was correct in doing what he did as a result. Uh, today's uh, negative uh, interpretations, and these have largely come from the feminist uh, movement of the uh, latter half of the 1900s. He's insensitive to teenage females, and uh, the term was developed uh, phaleocentric, which means he's male-oriented um, in Freud's entire lifetime. Societies were indeed male oriented. Um, Freud was not seeing beyond that, according to the critics. Uh, he was more like a policeman to patients than he was like a doctor, especially to this uh, young woman. And uh, uh, the whole notion of males having power over females, particularly their bodies. Uh, was way too rampant in Freud's day, and Freud fell for all that stuff. Uh, positive uh, uh, outcomes of this are that uh, I are, I, Ida Bauer today is a feminist role model. Uh, she was uh, taking uh, an active role in her coming of age, and uh, the therapy that was being presented to her, she didn't like, she quit after 11 weeks. Little Hands, this is the name given by Freud to the case of Herbert Graf. Graf lived from 1903 to 1973, 70 years old. Uh, Freud asked friends, to send him observations about their children and what sorts of curiosities of a sexual nature 
were your children exhibiting? He wanted to build up uh, a library of circumstances by which he could uh, further place emphasis on his uh, childhood sexuality theory. Or the and he said this would start in infancy, and it was called infantile sexuality theory. <clears throat> uh, Max Graff was a friend of Freud's, and his son was Herbert, who this case is about. Uh, little hands, uh, and uh, Max Graff wrote to Freud, and he said, "My son has a fear of horses." And uh, we were out walking once when he was just a kid and uh, there's a horse and carriage came by us and the whole carriage fell apart, just crumbled in the street. And uh, the people were injured that were in it. Uh, he was four years old at the time. And uh, uh, this accident uh, made him afraid to cross streets. Uh, we'd come to a street, I'd have to pick him up and carry him across or encourage him to walk across the street. Um, so a, a neurosis developed about that just, just a basic small fear about crossing streets. And he also uh, hated to be around horses. Uh, equinophobia is what that uh, fear was called. Uh, neurosis and psychosis. Neurosis is a kind of a gentle fear. Psychosis is something we really bury within ourselves and it's, uh, it's a major problem. That's the difference in psychology and psychiatry between neurosis and psychosis. Herbert, uh, Herbert also uh, wrote to Freud and said, uh, the kid's getting embarrassed uh, by his mother hugging him. Uh, I don't want to do that anymore. You know, he's getting old enough that uh, the mother uh, still wants to hug him, but the kid is uh, separating himself from his mother in terms of sharing that kind of physical closeness. Uh, and uh, he frequently, uh, the kid would frequently make comments about horses and how big their penises were. So Freud saw this whole thing as a fear and anxiety. Uh, now, uh, in, the fam in this family, uh, a daughter had just been born also. Uh, so the son, Herbert Graff, uh, little hands. Where'd this baby come from? Starting to ask questions like that. And uh, Freud wrote that a lot of these fears that he had that had built up about horses crossing the street, seeing carriages, stuff like that, uh, they were the result of sexual development. Uh, he and they were because of unanswered questions about uh, where people come from. Uh, and he, uh, once he uh, got into toilet training, he became very concerned about uh, bowel movements, fearful of them even. And uh, out of this uh, uh, human function of bowel movements came a concern about where babies come from also. So Herbert's father sat down with him and explained uh, uh, where babies come from and the fears disappeared. So Freud's got a case here. Uh, the criticism of this is uh, Freud plant Freud uh, and Herbert's father, uh, Freud, who eventually talked with uh, Herbert and Herbert's father, uh, they were planting a lot of these ideas in the kid's head. Uh, you know, the horse carriage, oh, isn't that unfortunate? That's too bad. That's really a dangerous thing. And the kid, so the kid gained a fear as a result early of what his father was saying, not what he'd seen. Uh, Herbert went on to lead a uh, 
rather extraordinary adult life. He became uh, the director of opera houses, engaged in world premieres of operas by famous composers, uh, worked closely uh, several times with Maria Callas, who was the, uh, you know, in the 1940s and uh, so on, was uh, the leading uh, female opera singer. He, be, he was living in Europe, became director of the opera houses in German cities, Munster, Breslau, Frankfurt, Salzburg, finally had to get out of Germany. He was a Jew uh, and he'd lived in Austria and that's, it was his association with Freud, but moved to Germany to uh, manage these opera houses. But he escaped the Holocaust, luckily, uh, by coming to the United States, where for 24 years, he became the director of the Metropolitan Opera in New York City. Uh, that was from 1936 to his retirement in 1960. This is not the opera house he managed. This is the Metropolitan Opera House today in New York City. It's just off of the South End south uh, west end of uh, Central Park at Lincoln Center, where there are lots of <clears throat> art groups. There's a ballet uh, theater and uh, opera and so on. Lots of stuff going on uh, that's arts related at uh, Lincoln Center. <coughs> uh, this is a picture of Herbert Graff as an adult. Uh, our third case study is titled Rat Man, and it's the story of Ernst Lanzer, at least we think it's his story. Uh, most people say, yes, this Ernst Lander, Lanzer was the patient Freud was describing. Some say it was a different person named Paul Lorenz. At any rate, um, Lanzer was... Uh, an attorney, he was a lawyer, and uh, he had very negative fantasies about rats. Uh, what's interesting is uh, the tremendous amount of fear of rats that people have. Veterinarians say they really make great pets. Uh, Freud wrote about this case, 1909, uh, and uh, the article he wrote about it is known as the case of obsessional neuroses. And I've talked about neuroses versus psychosis. Uh, neurosis is a more, as a mild uh, circumstance. Psychosis is uh, much more difficult. You hide, you hide your situation from yourself. Um, he uh, was having obsessive thoughts about rats and he was treated with hydrotherapy. We've talked about that already. Ida Bauer had that sort of treatment. Uh, and uh, uh, let me show you this other picture here. Uh, here's, a, here's a woman surrounded by nurses uh, receiving some hydrotherapy treatment. Uh, symptoms were uh, anxiety, which uh, is fear. Uh, that's about the misfortune that uh, friends were having or might have, or that family members are having or might have. In the case of Lanzer, he thought about the death of his father regularly. Uh, and it, once his father died, he still had those thoughts even after the death of his father. Uh, Freud used free association as a primary method of dealing with Lanzer. You might recall <clears throat> free association is where Freud would say a word and the patient was to say the first word that came into their mind. And anything that was out of the ordinary, Freud would come back to and want to discuss with the patient. So Freud would say red, 
most people would say blue, green, some other color. But some people might say, you'd say red, they'd say blood. That's unusual. So you'd come back and talk about that. And this was a way to uncover repressed thoughts that people were having, bring them to the fore and uh, make them aware of what was happening. Uh, Lanzer had been in the <clears throat> uh, Austrian military. And well, in the Austrian military, uh, he had learned about uh, torture techniques. And one of the methods of torture was you put a person in a very confining box and then introduce rats into the box, cover the whole box. And uh, that's a torture technique. And uh, that's what got him going on, uh, on rat fear. Uh, it stayed with him. He said, uh, boy, this could happen to me. <clears throat> this could happen to somebody I know. So Freud treated him by talking about, uh, uh, what could, did you ever see any rats when you were a kid? Uh, talked about repressed thoughts he might have from his childhood. Anybody ever tell you as a kid when you were doing, so, hey, we don't do that. And uh, uh, this, these, uh, these directions he was receiving in childhood, according to Freud, he passed that anxiety on to rats in his adulthood. Uh, later researchers wanted to interview Lanzer. They couldn't find him. Finally found out that he was among the death records of World War I, died very early in the war in 1914 at the age of 36. Uh, next case study, <clears throat> Daniel Sherber. <clears throat> Sherber lived from 1842 to uh, 1911, about 69 years. Uh, this is a picture of Sherber. Uh, he was an accomplished person. Uh, he was a judge, had a PhD degree. Uh, he was not a patient of Freud's, but Freud wrote about him. Well, how did Freud find out about him? Sherber published a book about his life and the difficulties that he'd had. And it's called uh, Memories of My Nervous Illness. <clears throat> and it was published in uh, 1903. And Freud read the book and then made comments about it. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Sherber was... Um, in a mental hospital in Pirna, Germany. Uh, this is uh, Schondenheim Castle that had been converted to a mental hospital. Uh, Freud published his ideas eight years after uh, Scherber's book had come out in 1911 and it was titled uh, Notes Upon an Autobiographical Account of a Case of Paranoia. <laughs> excuse me, paranoia. Paranoia is a tremendous fear about uh, what other people are doing to you or what they might do to you. Uh, I'm very suspicious of that person over there. What are they? They're going to do something to me. See, you're paranoid. Uh, someone's out to get me and somebody, somebody did. Uh, a lot of people say this was the major problem of Richard Nixon. <clears throat> Sherber's first symptoms appeared in 1884. He wrote the book about it in 1903, so it's almost 20 years later. Uh, he had was uh, in the 1880s here, he was a candidate for a seat in the Reichstag, that's the uh, German parliament. And uh, he experienced some hypochondria. Hypochondria is thinking you have an illness, but you don't. Here's a book about uh, imaginary illnesses. Is it all in your head? <clears throat> uh, he was treated for six months. Uh, nine years later, uh, 
the symptoms came back. Uh, that's 1883. Uh, also, sleeplessness uh, came back or started with him, couldn't get to sleep, uh, staying awake in the middle of the night. So now he, um, now he had these same fears, these same paranoias, but uh, he also had hypochondria. I'm sick, but I think I'm sick. And he had uh, sleeplessness. Uh, he fantasized that the world was so totally screwed up that everything had to be changed and that he would become the agent of change. The entire world needs a whole new population of some kind, probably a whole new species. God is going to grant to me uh, the giving of birth to these species, and I'm going to be the savior of the world. So something's wrong with all these other people. We got to get rid of them. Uh, this is paranoia, and uh, this is how it's going to happen. I'm going to be the father of the new species. So what does Sig Sigmund Freud say about all this? Uh, he was having doubts about religion. Freud developed the term redeemer delusion that uh, he felt that uh, uh, he was gonna be the savior of the world. And this was a delusional concept. Uh, he was gonna be elevated by God as the new world savior. Uh, fact, uh, Freud said the, the, the fact is he's been emasculated, meaning his manhood has been stolen. Uh, that was what he was feeling. And he may have been having uh, gay impulses. Next uh, patient that we'll talk about is uh, Sergei uh, Pana, Panahef, uh, lived from 1886 to 1979. He was uh, 93 years old. And uh, his case, in, when Freud wrote about it to hide his identity, was Wolfman. <clears throat> uh, 1910, he was a patient of Freud's. Uh, and he was, Freud nicknamed him Wolfman because of a dream that he had related to Freud. Uh, Freud published this case in 1918. Here's a copy of that uh, book by Freud, From the History of an Infantile Neurosis. Uh, Four major items in his life that uh, he talked to Freud about. He had a venereal disease at age 16, uh, at age 18. He'd been having sex for a couple of years and um, randomly, and as a result, uh, picked up a venereal disease. Once he was being uh, toilet trained, and then later in life, he had a lot of difficulty with bowel movements and he felt separated from the rest of the world. I'm not like other people, other people don't like me, etc. Uh, I have a veil over my head. Uh, why is this happening? Why am I in the dark? So he has these feelings that he's hiding from others. <clears throat> Freud told him, there's going to be a limited number of sessions. Uh, Freud might have a patient for a couple of years, but uh, Freud uh, had a fear that this guy was going to start becoming very resistive of Freud. Just talking to Freud would be difficult. And no, I don't agree with what you just said, etc. So Freud said, we're, we're going to do I, I don't know how many it was, but we're going to do 10 sessions. That's it. So there's a limit on the number of sessions. This was due to some of Freud's suspicions about the guy. He was a good child, uh, his parents uh, reported, uh, but he became very combative. 
And the combativeness started after his parents had taken a vacation, but didn't bring him with them. They wanted to be off alone for a couple of weeks. So they hired a nanny that took care of him. When the parents returned, he was just negative about everything they said, combative about things they wanted him to do. Uh, the parents ended up blaming themselves. Why, why in the world did we ever take that vacation alone? Who knew this is what was gonna happen to our child? Um, and he talked about at that same time, he started developing a fear of wolves. And to, to, um, to make it even more combative, his older sister, who knew he was afraid of wolves, would walk into his room with a book, hey, I found a picture of wolves, and shove it in his face, and would uh, uh, kind of regularly be teasing him about this fear of wolves. Here's some howlers. Uh, he also developed a fear of other creatures, in this case, insects. And the fear centered around beetles, butterflies, and caterpillars. One day he was out chasing butterflies uh, as a young boy, he was out with, uh, out with his father and uh, Suddenly he became uh, fearful of the butterflies. There were quite a few of them. And uh, he just ended the pursuit of chasing them, ran over to his father for protection. And uh, that led to this uh, fear of uh, insects. Um, uh, it, and it wasn't just limited to animals and insects. People got involved too. Leptodopteria phoba is uh, the uh, fear of butterflies. Uh, he had a, a going to bed routine that was an overly zealous religious uh, practice that he would do. Every night before he'd go to bed, he'd go around his parents' house and he would kiss all the icons they they had. It could be statues, it could be paintings, things like that. And he reported to Freud, but the whole time I was doing that, I was having blasphemous thoughts, thinking horrible things about religion. He had a dream that he reported to Freud. He was lying in bed and he looks out uh, the window in his bedroom. And up in the trees, staring in at him, was a pack of wolves. And these wolves all had different tails. Wolves usually had long, big, bushy tails. These wolves all had very short tails. And they wouldn't take their eyes off of me. They were watching me all the time. Uh, he then related a, a story that his grandfather told him when he was a child about how wolves lose their tails. And it was because uh, the wolves would go fishing and they'd stick their tails into the water to attract the fish and the fish would bite off their tails. <clears throat> so <clears throat> his grandfather told him uh, that the wolves lost these tails uh, because they were fishing. Uh, Freud saw this as uh, uh, this is a failure at doing something. What kind of a failure is it for this young man? It's a uh, concern about sexual performance. And uh, this contributed greatly to his ongoing anxiety. Uh, the next uh, uh, and final person that we're going to talk about is Bertha Pappenheim. Uh, Freud uh, called her Anna O in his writings, lived to be 77 years old, died before Freud in 1936. Uh, here is a series of photos of Bertha Pappenheim. 
uh, from a young woman to a, a middle age and uh, beyond. Uh, Freud didn't treat her. Uh, this is the case that his good friend and fellow physician, another medical doctor, uh, Josef Breuer, however, uh, was the person who treated her. And uh, Breuer uh, talked to Freud a great deal about this case. They ended up writing a book together that's pictured here called Studies on Hysteria. Uh, that includes uh, the story of Bertha Pappenheim. Uh, she was treated by Breuer, 1880 to 1882. Uh, she was in her early 20s at the time, and they wrote this book in 1895, so it was, uh, you know, 12 to 15 years after the case. Uh, Breuer uh, and Freud were very close for many years, but when uh, Freud started publishing his sexual theories, uh, Breuer uh, was not accepting of them and uh, broke off the relationship that he'd had with Freud. Uh, there were nine symptoms to uh, Miss Pappenheim's uh, hysteria. First, there was a paralysis or paresis. Uh, and it was, for her, it was the right arm and right leg. Hydrophobia, she had a fear of water. She didn't want to drink it. She didn't want to go into it in a lake or a swimming pool. Involuntary eye movements. And this, uh, this could be, uh, you're talking, but you're looking around all the time. You're not looking at the person you're talking to. You're looking up and down and sideways. And, and, um, and you got some facial pain that's associated with this. And Sometimes a squinting will help, but uh, also people, she would report, I, I really can't see what that is, so you'd squint to try to see it better. Uh, and she thought items were oversized, so she would squint to make them appear smaller. And she would be talking to Freud in a session, and she would mix languages. She'd talk her native German and then switch to French and then switch to Spanish and then back to German. Uh, this is known as aphrasia. Uh, she had hallucinations. They involved uh, skeletons uh, of humans and black snakes. And uh, she was seeing things that weren't there. Uh, that's, uh, there's no skeleton there, there's no black snake. These are visions that you're having. Uh, it's not uncommon in this day and age for people to nap in the afternoon. It wasn't just uh, the seriously elderly that would take naps. And uh, she would wake up uh, with screams during these naps and she'd been having visions of uh, different things. Uh, while she was napping in the afternoon. Uh, she also uh, had false pregnancies. She'd talk about, well, I, I'm pregnant. Uh, they'd check her and she was not pregnant, but she had the, uh, the uh, feeling that she definitely was pregnant. Oh. Uh, amnesia. Uh, she would come to see Breuer, and uh, she'd forget about things that were said two meetings ago or at the last meeting. Uh, I don't remember saying that at all. Um, and finally, she had mood swings, uh, and Breuer could observe this even in an hour-long session. She'd move from anxiety to depression to being very relaxed calm and uh, able to talk to him very uh, straightforward like. Um, she reported daydreams and night dreams uh, and she'd be talking to people who were sick. She'd be at their bedside and uh, frequently it wasn't strangers or neighbors. 
she would be talking to her father who was bedridden with tuberculosis. And she uh, just developed this whole notion that she, uh, she wanted to protect sick people. Uh, then uh, as a child, she saw a dog drinking from a water glass. And uh, that's what got her into this hydrophobia fear, this fear of water. Under hypnosis, uh, she uh, talked about these items uh, and that aided Breuer in giving her resolution. Uh, after two years, she appeared to be very fine. As a matter of fact, she went on to have quite an extraordinary life in the history of feminism. Uh, she was uh, treated at this hospital after she saw Breuer, uh, Lake Constance, Switzerland for six months. Critics of psychoanalysis in the late 1800s uh, use this as a case that uh, it didn't work. Uh, 20th century medical doctor said uh, she probably had meningitis, a disease of the brain that caused these symptoms. So they really couldn't be cured or treated <clears throat> uh, with uh, psychoanalysis or psychology. Uh, she recovered, became a feminist. She moved from Austria to Frankfurt, Germany, pictured here on this map. And she became known throughout Europe. Uh, over the rest of her life. In 1895, she managed an orphanage. And while working at that orphanage, she was reading to uh, children the uh, childhood books of Hans Christian Andersen and got so interested in child literature uh, that she wrote some books herself for children. Here's one of them, Sisyphus. Sisyphus was a person in uh, uh, Greek and uh, Roman mythology, pushing a rock up a hill, almost get to the top, and then the rock would fall to the bottom again, and have to go back down the hill and start pushing it up to the top again, and the whole thing would repeat itself. Here's a poem she wrote. <clears throat> Love did not come to me, so I vegetate like a plant in a cellar without light. Love did not come to me, so I resound like a violin whose bow has been broken. Love did not come to me, so I immerse myself in work, living myself sore from duty. Love did not come to me, so I gladly think of death as a friendly face. <clears throat> Uh, she translated uh, the works of Mary Wollstonecraft uh, uh, Shelley. Uh, her mo in, uh, in, and uh, one of Shelley's most famous works is in the history of feminism, a vindication of the rights of woman. And that's what she translated into the German. Uh, Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, however, uh, besides being famous for this work, is also the same person that wrote the novel Frankenstein. Uh, the actual title of the book was uh, Frankenstein, the Modern Prometheus. Uh, she started a Jewish charity uh, to combat female slavery. Uh, Jewish men could leave their wives. They could get divorced if they wanted, but they didn't have to. Uh, they could leave the children that they'd had with that wife. They could remarry. Uh, women couldn't get divorces. They couldn't leave their husbands or their children. Uh, and uh, uh, she wanted the, all that changed. Uh, daughters were often sold to wealthy families then. And of course, the, 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 the husband in the family had actually purchased them so that he could in turn sell them into prostitution. She wanted to end all that. Uh, she started the German Women's Association to stop this practice. That was in 1901. In 1904, she founded another organization called Women's Relief. Here is a stamp 
honoring her and the organization. And you can see in the black, red, and yellow, and in the white part too, you can see women's faces on the stamp there. Uh, she headed the League of Jewish Women for 20 years. It had 32,000 members, 82 groups uh, throughout Germany. Uh, she died in 1936. This group was disbanded by the Nazis in 1939. Here's a uh, picture of her burial uh, place. Uh, there was a memorial German stamp uh, put out to her. Here is a photo of it. That's the end of Freud. Remember, no class next week. Week after, I'll be uh, doing Alfred Adler, who was also a close friend of Freud's. And uh, Judy, <clears throat> do we have anything more today? Uh, well, we have time, uh, a little time for questions. And we do have some questions uh, to the audience. I will say, if you have a question for JB about anything he's talked about uh, today, now is your chance. Type it in the Q&A line, please. Um, first question, uh, does an only child have uh, special difficulties with the anal and phallic stage, uh, stages of development? Uh, actually, uh, I'm going to talk about that with Adler. Oh, okay. Ad Adler has these uh, child, your position in a family. Mm -hmm. Like I'm from a family of six children. I'm the second born. So mm -hmm. birth order is a very important Adlerian concept. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk about that. Now, I won't answer that question specifically, but no, I know of nothing about that. I suspect the Freudians have some comments about only children and their sexual development. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll try to look something up. Maybe I can include it in the lecture if I find something. Okay, uh, next time yeah. then. Um, yeah. This questioner says, Freud's dream interpretations seem pretty outlandish. Are there still Freudian analysts who do this kind of dream interpretation? Uh, yes, there are. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's not uncommon. Uh, it's especially <clears throat> more common on, uh, on the East and West Coast in the United States. There's lots of Freudian psychologists around the country. But here in the Midwest, we are primarily behaviorists. John Watson, B.F. Skinner, people like that. I've written lectures on both of those individuals uh, also. Uh, so <clears throat> yeah, um, of course, Freudians answer this concern with, uh, you know, sex is a difficult topic. Uh, and uh, that's what Freud talked about. And he talked about, uh, you know, sex developing within families, not necessarily physical, but the Oedipus complex, the desire for the mother. Lots of people are resistant to talk about sex. We, we are really a, a non-sexual society. Uh, I mean, who settled here from Europe? Puritans. Yeah. We are, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, uh, it's 400 years later, <clears throat> we still are uh, tied up in their concerns. Weren't late 19th century uh, Viennese even more adverse to talking about sex than, than modern Americans? And, yeah. and didn't that affect Freud's reputation somewhat at the time? Yeah. Yes. And a lot of his friends walked away from him as a result of, uh, and, and of course he used as an argument the very fact that you're you're hiding all this, you're covering it up, uh, mm -hmm. you know. That's, yeah. uh, and uh, you know, women were heavily clothed. It wasn't until the 1920s that we started seeing women wearing shorter skirts. We started seeing women wear pants, uh, so you could see the shape of their legs, and uh, mm -hmm. so 
things were very much hidden uh, about sexuality and especially uh, female body form uh, mm -hmm. up, uh, at, during the entire time that Freud was writing. Sure. This questioner says, how popular are uh, Freud's uh, or Freudian ideas and techniques among therapists today? And I guess you've spoken somewhat about that, but maybe you want to add. Uh... Uh, he's, uh, he's still alive and well among many therapists. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, you can look this up, you know, you can go, you can go into uh, <coughs> uh, Google and just type in a uh, search for Freudian therapist or recent articles about psychoanalysis, stuff like that. You'll find uh, lots of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, that is, we don't have any other questions currently in the Q&A line, but we do have several minutes left. So I will say to the audience now, if you have a, a question, now is your chance. Type something in. And uh, while we're waiting for those questions to come in, I have a question myself, and it has to do with, uh, with feminists' uh, later view of Freud. Uh, in particular, uh, Freud told Dora that he believed her about, you know, sexual abuse. But I believe later on, uh, he said that it was hysteria, that it was, you know, that it never really happened, that she was fantasizing the whole abuse. Um, and, and isn't that at the heart of the, the feminist case against Freud, that he didn't really listen, that he didn't believe his female patients uh, when it came to, you know, terrible uh, sexual abuse. He, uh, the issue is, did it really happen? And mm -hmm. I think, I think what Freud was talking about with, with this uh, 16 year old woman was, uh, uh, I think he assumed it was fantasy, mm -hmm. but she needed someone to believe in her. Mm -hmm. And uh, he thought that uh, by stating that, mm -hmm. uh, I, I agree with what you're telling me, that uh, that would lead to uh, mm -hmm. resolution, and it indeed mm -hmm. did. Yeah. I mean, the did... physical, physical uh -huh. symptoms disappeared. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, no, feminists have a great deal of difficulty with Freud, yeah. He, mm -hmm. And he's, you know, I'm not excusing it. He's, he's from a different age, and yeah. there were men. There were men who were very much in favor of feminism back in this day. Oscar Wilde, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did Freud choose which patients to write about? It, it seemed to me that when you went through the case studies. Uh, a surprising number of them became very well-known people in later life. And I, and I wondered, you know, did he only write about famous people uh, or, or did, uh, did his patients just happen to be very well-known? Uh, what was the, what, what happened there? He was well-educated. He mm -hmm. was making money. He lived in neighborhoods where other people were wealthy and could afford to send their children to him. Uh -huh. And these were, these were people that were kind of on a <clears throat> destiny track to <laughs> <clears throat> being professionals, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, today, uh, I mean, I have former students who are, are, are therapists and uh, they have no patience uh, or I mean, they have no clients. Mm -hmm. They have oh, oh, zero yeah. clients who are paying their own way mm -hmm. through appointments. They all have health coverage. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, I've asked them about this. They say 100% my entire career has been people with health coverage. But since, you know, popular, in the popular mind, you always hear about Freudian analysis taking years and years. And, and yeah. is that really covered by health insurance? 10 years of Freudian analytic therapy? 
Yeah, I don't know how long a, uh, mm -hmm. a, a health insurance company will allow you to go. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if they stop this stuff after six months or yeah. what they yeah. uh, I, yeah. I don't know what their rules are, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, one of the major criticisms of Freudian psychology is the long-term care that mm -hmm. occurs. Uh, you're trying to get people to discover um, on their own, you know, bring them to a realization through the use of different techniques. Uh, and they go, oh, hey, well, I, I think I could. And, you know, it's self-discovery stuff and it takes a while. Mm -hmm. uh, when I do the lecture on Viktor Frankl, Viktor Frankl is meaning therapy. Mm -hmm. He wants to give meaning. He had a patient whose um, wife had died and the patient uh, was in his seventies and he quit shaving, he quit bathing regularly. Uh, he quit talking to his kids. Uh, he, he just became so full of grief. Uh, and his kids sent him to see Frankel in uh, mm -hmm. Vienna, Austria. And uh, Frankel said to him, isn't it fortunate that your wife died first? Look at the problems you have saved her from. <laughs> and that gave meaning to what he was mm -hmm. going through and he became a decent person again. And it was like, bang, it just happened, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it didn't take two years. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm afraid uh, we are pretty much out of time. It seems that we'd have no more questions. Uh, so we're going to thank you, J.B. Anderson. Um, Good week. Yeah, remember everyone, no class next week, uh, but we will see you again two weeks from today. And uh, the subject in two weeks will be Alfred Adler. So please join us then. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye now.